Hello and welcome everyone to this uh, virtual conference by Entrepreneur India. Uh, today's discussion will revolve around the, how are startups gearing up for the post-COVID world. Uh, I am Saurav Kumar, Editor of Special Projects, Entrepreneur India, your host and moderator for the session. Today, I mean, these uh, unprecedented uh, circumstances owing to the uh, novel coronavirus outbreak, we are going to try and find uh, answers to some of the questions that may have cropped up in the uh, business community. Uh, so uh, I'll start by uh, laying out some uh, ground rules here uh, for uh, the attendees and for others as well. Uh, so the discussion will go on for 40 minutes. Uh, this will be followed by a Q&A session for the next 20 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions during the course of the discussion, you can post them uh, to the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Uh, mention in your question if it is directed uh, at any specific question. We would also like to request the attendees to keep the questions within the scope of the discussion here today. Uh, there will be also, uh, polls will be conducted during the session, so I'll request everyone to uh, kindly participate. Uh, let me now introduce our, our session co-hosts for today, Mr. Ritu Maria, the Editor-in-Chief of Entrepreneur India and Asia Pacific. Our uh, panelists today are uh, Mr. Raghav Joshi, CEO India Business Unit, Rebel Foods. Mr. Prashant Tandon, co-founder and CEO, 1MG. Mr. Bipin Preet Singh, founder and CEO, MobiQuick. To start with, uh, uh, so I'll start the, uh, 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 with the panelists now to start with, given that our uh, pan, uh, everyone operates in uh, separate verticals, I think the attendees would want to know what challenges have you faced due to COVID and uh, the subsequent uh, lockdown? And more importantly, the learnings uh, that you're going to take away from here to prepare yourself uh, for, uh, for the uh, you know, uh, post-COVID scenario. So uh, Prashant, if I can start with you, please. All right, so during this phase, I think uh, for us, it's a structural positive disruption from a business perspective. Um, we are seeing unprecedented demand right now. The challenge is actually in fulfillment. Uh, logistics is very much hampered. Um, uh, team uh, availability, a lot of people have gone back to the villages, so that is a problem. Morale is, a, is certainly an issue. Uh, but other than that, um, we are just stretched. We have way more demand. Um, that we need to cater to. And uh, right now we are just making sure that our operations are gearing up every day and getting better to service those demands. So I think post COVID, what we believe is going to happen from a health tech perspective is that um, this is a structural shift in um, uh, towards health tech. People, will, uh, people actually clearly appreciate the, the benefits of um, uh, this model of engaging with healthcare. It's safer, it's convenient. And what's happening is a lot of trial is being generated during this phase. Users are getting to experience this as the model to serve them. And uh, for us, we believe this is a fairly significant step jump. Um, so for us, the challenges are really going to be more about keeping up the, uh, uh, the supplies. And the second part is, of course, we have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, uh, we are entering into a phase where uh, sustainability of businesses, unit economics, um, capital uh, availability runway will be key for every business. So we also have to make sure our our, uh, our cost structures are um, uh, best in class, highly controlled. So, and that will be a theme of the ecosystem. I think everybody will be uh, working in preparation of a capital constrained um, uh, next couple of uh, quarters at least. Uh, let me also welcome uh, our, uh, our panelist, uh, Mr. Greg Moran, CEO and co-founder Zoomcar. Welcome, Greg. Nice. Hi. Right. So, uh, Greg, if I can come to you, uh, and uh, uh, you know, if you can uh, tell us that uh, in terms of uh, your business and the industry, uh, what are the learnings that uh, you know you're going to take away from here to prepare yourself uh, for the post-COVID world and the other startups who are aspiring to be in this business would they can also keep in mind when they start resume business. Sure, sure. <clears throat> so I think for us, it's, it's a little bit unique in the sense that, um, you know, we're probably one of the most hard hit startups, um, you know, in terms of sector right now during the lockdown, um, you know, given the fact that within mobility, 
uh, you have a hundred percent shutdown in the business and uh, you're not able to serve any customers, uh, you know, given the, the government uh, orders. Um, so for us, we've had to innovate around uh, sort of B2B use cases and working and collaborating with large um, you know, food tech players, logistics players, health tech players, um, government services. So effectively all of the emergency essential services providers. So I think that's something which um, has given us an opportunity to kind of branch out into a, a new business. Um, of course, that's not been kind of historically what we've done in terms of operation. Um, but I think what you know, we also see at the same time is that as the whole lockdown uh, resumes or emerges as we come out of this um, gradually over the, the coming weeks and months, um, I, I think what we see is a, a huge shift uh, in terms of the uh, you know, individuals going from a sort of like an Ola Uber, um, you know, going from a mass transit to more personal transport, which is you know, much more uh, sanitized, clean, reliable, uh, private. And that's something which you know, we see just a tremendous disruption uh, across. And I think that's where you know, we're actually looking and modeling for you know, a significant, uh, maybe a five or 10 X uplift in terms of overall demand uh, over the six to 12 month period. So I, I think we're just actually really trying to think about how we do fulfillment uh, in this period post COVID, um, because I, I think it will take a long time <clears throat> for the attitudes to sort of readjust. Um, so I, I think that's where we have to be um, front and center trying to capitalize. Okay, okay. Uh, Raghav, if you can uh, please come in and you know, uh, share uh, your learnings right now in terms of food business that, uh, that's going to help you with the post COVID. Right. Um... I think Prashant and Greg have provided, you know, two very different views from the demand side. On one side, you know, um, <clears throat> um, pharma sector is seeing and Prashant's company is seeing, uh, you know, huge spur, spur in demand. Um, while, you know, for uh, for Zoomcar, um, it's clearly, you know, the other side. Uh, for us, it has been, you know, sort of a mixed bag uh, in terms of being uh, a very volatile uh, last couple of weeks. It almost feels like you know, um, a couple of years, not a couple of weeks. Uh, and, uh, you know, it has been mm, very volatile, not just on the demand side, but also on the supply side as well. Um, so, you know, if we just uh, uh, do a quick flashback, we see that, um, you know, from, from March 22nd, when the lockdown started, the first lockdown on 22nd, and then from 25th onwards, the, the period which is going on right now, uh, there were uh, a lot of challenges on the on the regulatory front where the central government and the state governments you know in the best interest of uh, people of the country you know were trying to make sure that as much as possible uh, people stay indoors and you know um, social distancing and everything is maintained and at the same time they were also trying to ensure that uh, essential <laughs> services are are on and food delivery uh, you know unfortunately fell into a category which was not crystal clear. Uh, so, you know, there were multiple interpretations uh, across uh, state and central governments um, on this. And uh, eventually, uh, you know, by the by the last week of the month, by, you know, by, uh, by March 31st and April 1st, around that period, everybody sort of agreed that, you know, food delivery should be an essential service and the Ministry of Home Affairs uh, uh, memo in this regard made it clear. So the first week of post lockdown, we had, uh, you know, a lot of time spent at police stations across the country trying to convince the you know the local authorities that we should be allowed to open um, and those challenges uh, are not there anymore so, so so the first task for us was to you know get those challenges cleared and get our our kitchens live um, after that uh, you know it has been also a little bit of a challenge on the supply side from a uh, from a supply chain perspective and from uh, you know staffing perspective, ensuring that you know we have enough staff at each kitchen, and ensuring that we get the raw materials uh, you know delivered on time from uh, from our partners. Uh, that has been the the phase of uh, navigation over the last couple of weeks on the supply side. But I think we are pretty much sorted now. We have uh, you know 90% uh, plus of our network uh, which is up and running across the country. Tier one cities are mostly up. Uh, you know where uh, solving the regulatory issues has been easier tier two cities and some cities which have higher exposure to to covid you know there uh, there has been still uh, a little bit of a challenge in getting the network up but we are hopeful of uh, of solving that as well in the next few days on the demand side uh, you know it's again been an interesting story while the orders have been pretty volatile 
we are seeing uh, an increase in the average order value because people are staying indoors and ordering in groups and we are also seeing a shift towards uh, brands which which have uh, you know high level of trust from a customer's perspective so for example behrus biryani in, in our case avan story pizza you know these are uh, these are the brands which are actually seeing uh, higher demand as compared to pre pre lockdown period um we are seeing this across the globe you know the pizza industry is seeing uh, a perception that uh, you know customers feel that pizza going through an oven at 500 degrees fahrenheit you know sort of takes care of the virus so must be safe also so pizza is is one category which is actually growing uh and uh, we are seeing that different a uh, sort of shift across different brands in our portfolio so it's been pretty interesting from from that perspective um we've also introduced to to handle the situation we've introduced uh, you know extra measures which create consumers trust for example you know taking temperature and showing it to every customer on every order uh, of all of all our, uh, our our staff at the kitchen so if you order from the uh, behrus biryani website uh, you know you will see the temperature of each person in the kitchen and uh, you know that is something which is obviously becoming uh, more relevant right now um, this is something probably uh, not there uh, anywhere else in the world we've seen but other things such as contactless delivery you know a drop by at society gates etc which which the industry is in general adopting that those are things that you know we've uh, initiated as well um, the uh, the other interesting thing which is specific to our sector is uh the opportunity to serve the needy at this point in time uh there are a lot of people millions of people actually who are stranded at different places uh you know we've seen in the news that uh, uh at delhi isbt uh, you know people were stranded they were trying to cross the borders and a lot of them got stranded and you know did not have food for many days so delhi disaster management authority you know just to give you an anecdote contacted us uh, on 26th march night saying that you know hundreds of people are stranded uh and uh, in a matter of few hours we we provided about 1200 meals and uh, you know those sort of opportunities have since been coming uh, across the country and uh, you know very quickly we've put up a website called food for good on which consumers can go and they can uh, you know donate meals to the people who are who are needy and we prepare those meals and serve uh, those consumers through an, a network of ngos so that has suddenly become a you know a, a massive uh, way for us to uh, you know build on uh, build on this uh, our social capital i would say and you know take uh, you know fulfill our responsibility our csr in this uh, at this point in time uh, while the other demand you know still keeps getting volatile so it's been uh, you know so many different journeys for in the last couple of weeks and you know we are just trying to make sure that uh, you know uh, <clears throat> we we handle all of it in the right way thank you uh vipin i'll come to you now so completely different space uh, payment uh, and uh, you know fintech so uh, what has been your learning and uh, you know which uh, which, uh, which will help you uh, uh, you know when we uh, get out of this situation yeah so um see from our point of view mumbai quick operates a fintech platform which obviously where the core is uh, around payments digital payments um, but also <clears throat> over the years we have added uh, digital loans um, uh, digital and micro insurance uh, as well as uh, wealth management uh, using mutual funds digital gold etc so we are actually seeing interesting different trends across all these different categories of use cases um one thing is clear is that you know from a macro point of view as you must have already noticed that everybody including the government is uh, is focusing and telling people to go digital uh, which obviously makes a lot more sense given that you know cash could be one uh, you know way of transmitting uh, this virus uh, so from a adoption point of view uh, i think you know it was anyway a, a long term positive trend for digital payments and so we seen uh, a lot of adoption new adoption from users uh, in addition because of the lockdown a lot of the essential services um which were still operating in cash in india like for example paying for your mobile bill or mobile recharge or paying for your tata sky or satellite television or paying just your electricity bill 
I think all those bill payments, you know, you can't basically pay with cash anymore, at least during the lockdown. And so um, the digital adoption of a lot of these essential services, uh, which reach out to millions of users, uh, is increasing at a, at a at a very rapid pace, and that's that's um, basically a great uh, for our top of the funnel um, for a lot of the new users entering into the ecosystem. And so, uh, you know, we are seeing record numbers of uh, new users and new transactions uh, every day. Um, we also obviously are seeing that a lot of the key categories in payments are also badly hit. Um, you know, which uh, which also are very important. Uh, like, for example, of course, travel. Uh, travel is a very powerful category for adoption of digital payments. So from booking of your train tickets to booking of your flight tickets or bus rides or, you know, Zoom car or, you know, Uber or any other kind of service, you know, I think it's completely shut. Uh, so that that's has a completely negative impact on uh, you know digital payments because it's all stopped uh, and other any other kind of consumption which is uh, discretionary in nature uh, i think most of the e-commerce is shut uh, right i mean except essential services like food uh, grocery um, medicine etc so this is having a big impact in terms of people spending on you know anything right literally uh, fashion is uh, e-commerce uh, or people are not buying phones uh, people are not buying electronics, people are not buying furniture, so so everything is completely shut. So as a derivative of all these, uh, all this commerce, you know, digital payments also has to take a hit there. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mixed bag in that sense, that there's a lot of new users coming in, a lot of small ticket transactions happening, a lot of you, new users are getting the taste of digital payments for the first time, uh, but a lot of the, obviously, the existing users uh, have uh, are not making any purchases, which we hope will uh, you know obviously rectify because the lockdown is not uh, permanent and hopefully the you know the commercial activity or the economic activity uh, will resume. Um, on digital credit, uh, which is you know what we provide to our customers uh, for spending on the platform, that's obviously taken a a massive hit because you know at this point. Uh, people don't know what is the impact on jobs uh, is going to be, uh, what is the impact on on people's ability to repay their loans uh, will be. And so risk is uh, very uncertain. And so a lot of the lenders, I mean, we are not a lender, but we facilitate, um, you know, the capital from lenders in order to uh, disburse it digitally to uh, millions of our customers. Uh, which we have been doing for the last two years. Uh, I think most of it is is, is stopped for now because uh, you know there is isn't a, a, any appetite uh, to take risk. Uh, so I think next three months, the how people behave during the moratorium that has been offered, and how soon the lockdown is recovered, how soon collections will come back. I think that will play a very important role. Um, one sector which is obviously uh, seeing a surgeons, surgeons in demand is basically insurance. I think similar to uh, the health products. I think what this um, virus is doing is creating awareness about health, uh, mortality, and life uh, in a very big way. Uh, and so we've seen a big jump in people trying to buy uh, insurance products uh, digitally. Mobiquick offers various kinds of health insurance products. Uh, you know, or accident insurance, life insurance on its platform, which can be purchased and, uh, with one click. So we're seeing significant demand um, and significant improvement in conversions there uh, because, uh, you know, we are one of the few platforms which is, uh, which is making these products available digitally. Uh, we also launched a specific insurance for COVID-19 and that's also seen a, uh, seen a very significant uptake. So I think that will again be a very strong long-term adoption for insurance because people awareness about the risk associated with their health and their life. Uh, I think that that outlook would have has completely changed. It's, it's changing already. Lastly, I think uh, we, we have obviously seen the markets, stock markets, how they've been performing, you know, wildly going down, going, um, going up. 
uh, obviously a lot of uh, foreign institutional investors have uh, withdrawn from the Indian market in the last uh, one month or so uh, since this virus became really a pandemic. Uh, but what we are seeing uh, as a counter to this is a lot of new retail customers coming in and buying mutual funds. I mean, we don't do stock broking, but we provide uh, you know, customers an ability to invest into mutual funds, uh, all the 40 asset management companies that are there. And so we're seeing a lot of new users uh, investing. Uh, they obviously think that this is, there's some kind of bottom here in terms of uh, stock prices um, of very good, good companies having corrected a lot. So there is a lot of new investment activity uh, that is happening as well as, uh, so I think, you know, uh, it's, a, it's across the board. I would say the other piece related to mutual funds is that uh, you know, you can't really put cash into mutual funds uh, at this time because all the branches um, are all closed. Uh, and, you know, even though they may be cover covered in the essential services, I think, you know, right now most of them are closed, which means that people are going away from uh, cash-based uh, investing uh, or any form of checks or any, any ki other kind of instruments to really investing using digital channels like, uh, like Mopico Cap. So... Overall, um, we've seen uh, obviously a strong adoption, um, uh, but you know, the time will tell in the next uh, three months, how much of this adoption will be uh, longer lasting. So uh, uh, there was this question from uh, one of our attendees who sent earlier that, you know, of course, uh, the, uh, 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 every business is disrupted. So how is the uh, high, risk, uh, high risk scenario with, uh, with the startups right now? Both uh, tech and non-tech roles, and uh, when do you expect it to recover? Uh, uh, how soon do you expect it to recover? Within, if I can, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So uh, my question was that one of our attendees uh, sent a question. You know, they 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 uh, they're looking at that. How is hiring impacted both in uh, tech and non-tech roles during this uh, period? So uh, I think, you know, my, our understanding is that hiring is um, pretty much frozen across the board uh, for all companies. Uh, you know, there is maybe a little bit of tech hiring that is still happening. Uh, but, you know, at this time, I don't think anybody is hiring for non-tech roles. Um, the reason is simple that, you know, non-tech roles primarily are around either marketing or sales or business development. Uh, or operations which require a physical presence. Uh, anything which requires, you know, meetings to happen or people to interact more, uh, I think is, is not happening at this time. So every company has been, at least all the, I would say companies which are, um, you know, a lot of the funded companies are being also advised uh, to go completely slow or just stop hiring. Uh, and so I think there's also pressure from a lot of investors uh, to uh, not to push the pedal on hiring. As far as we are concerned, we are continuing to hire for key select tech roles. Uh, but I think, you know, that's what at least I see across the board. Other people can chip in. Yeah. Uh, Radhav, if I can, uh, if I can uh, ask you that uh, your business is not as much, as, you know, that there is some movement at least. So, uh, how is the uh, how, with the human resources? How what is the scenario right now? So I think uh, you know what Bipin mentioned as far as hiring is concerned. That's that's uh, that is actually uh, the scenario industry agnostic right now. Um, Non-essential uh, roles definitely you know are 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 the roles where definitely hiring is not not happening uh, within uh, non-tech specifically. Within uh, within tech, I think the long-term uh, opportunities that companies would be uh, focusing on, those would still be that, you know, they would continue to focus on uh, assuming the cash situation, the the funding situation is, is you know, uh, <clears throat> not not completely in dire straits. Uh, so I think companies which, which are uh, unit positive, which do not have to worry as much about uh, runways, burn, etc., they would continue to focus on, uh, you know, long-term uh, bets during this time. Um, you know, short-term with demand going down, uh, specifically in uh, in most of the sectors, 
I think uh, business related hiring is definitely on hold right now. So in terms of uh, in terms of plans that you had uh, say for your uh, for your move kitchens or something so will you stick with that or will you look to uh, u- utilize your existing assets more uh, efficiently in a, or maybe uh, you know different way what would be the, uh, how what should be the uh, uh, way uh, so uh... you know it would be slightly difficult for me to comment on uh, you know what's happening specifically inside rebel but what i can definitely share as the industry trend here is that uh, nobody is thinking of expanding uh, you know kitchen networks uh, or you know restaurant networks too much you know during this time i think in general for uh, all the industry that's important that any capital expenditure spend is uh, is evaluated uh very very carefully because uh, right now you know at least in the short term the return on investment on capital expenditure is definitely in question uh so so capex spends uh, you know non discretionary spends um you know uh, on on the operating side things such as travel you know um, spends which can be avoided those spends are definitely you know the ones which are getting deprioritized across across sectors uh i think it's important for startups to evaluate um you know uh, depending on their cash situation and the runway situation on which are the spends that they can immediately cut down uh, you know without impacting things such as employee morale um so you know uh, i would i would bring an analogy in here you know to think of uh, of of a of a company which is you know sort of in a boat uh, so to speak and you know the the shore is quite some distance away and the cash is is effectively the fuel that you have to get to the shore now uh, with no more fuel coming in from from outside you know nobody else providing that to you you have to see that how much weight do you take off the boat so that your chances of reaching the shore increase and uh, you know the weights which you can possibly just remove off the boat and throw into the sea um so that you become more efficient in this time you know are probably those spends which which can be avoided such as you know uh, travel etc if that is not enough uh, you know you don't still foresee that you'll reach there then you know uh, i think the first things which are going out of the window are you know the annual bonuses because this is also the time of of bonuses uh, across sectors year ends are happening uh, so i think most of the companies are uh, taking calls on bonuses uh after that you know comes uh, comes things like startups should evaluate that uh that you know salaries if they need compensation need to be deferred or even worse if compensations need to be uh, you know uh cut for the short term i think that's that's something which is which has started happening uh especially in 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 the startup space um so yeah so i would you know as a suggestion to startups i would say that you know try to think of uh, costs which do not affect people try to cut those costs first and then obviously you know uh, the one time costs on people such as bonuses those could be the second uh, you know uh, second thing on the list and after that you know uh, you know things which which obviously you would want to avoid um, such as you know cutting uh, compensations or you know in the worst case uh, layoffs so i would I, i think that 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 is what uh, startups would be evaluating you know as the hierarchy right now in terms of spends and capex obviously comes at the top so capex is the first thing that gets cut during this time okay okay prashant if i can uh, come to you uh, now so in one of our uh, webinars uh, one of the investors said that you know uh, this is the demonetization moment for healthcare sector in india what's your view how do you see it changing post uh, whatever is happening right now? i think it's it's largely accurate i think uh, this is the time when all the value proposition of digitally delivered healthcare um, is is clearly appreciated the behavioral change is underway and it's not underway only in the consumer side of course consumers are getting to see that this is a safer more convenient easier method they are getting the trial uh, of this uh, kind of a service and from what we have seen once they they actually try it out themselves then um, Uh, they do stick quite a bit but the behavioral change actually is of the rest of the ecosystem uh, even more profoundly be it the, the government or the regulators uh, be it the institutions the doctors the hospitals the insurance companies uh, the pharma companies 
so all of them are now waking up to the fact that this is how consumers are going to engage with um, uh, with healthcare and how, uh, how quickly they need to adapt to this kind of a new reality so yes i think it's a it's a very significant um, structural shift in um, in favor of uh, 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 digital health um, and all, a lot of healthcare businesses will actually have to move very fast in uh, figuring out their own digital strategy right now and it's happening as we speak okay. okay uh greg if, if if i can come to you and uh, ask you that uh, you know uh, until now a lot of uh, growth uh, people say was more uh, quantitative rather than qualitative so do you think uh, post this uh, scenario uh, the focus will be uh, on reducing burns and getting quality uh, you know customers on board and uh, do uh, better business sure no, i think absolutely i mean to echo uh, to echo what's been said uh, by other panelists i mean i think definitely uh, the focus will you have to go towards quality because um, especially in the mobility space um, you know quality means uh, you know directly translating to to better unit economics um, you know you have you know quality can manifest itself in a number of different ways um, you know you you can actually see um, you know, quality coming in in terms of a higher you know, average order value, so a higher basket value equivalent, uh, which which leads to um, inherently better you know economics. Um, you know, it also you know leads to a um, you know much better sort of overall cost profile, uh, and and so you know I think there's a lot of ways that um, you know companies can kind of take advantage uh, in in these times uh, to ensure quality. I think for for Zoom cars specifically, um, you know we've always had a, a very intense focus on IoT. Uh, in terms of vehicle monitoring, uh, driver behavior monitoring, and you know, I, I think coming out of um, you know this type of crisis, uh, as as people start to to come back uh, onto road, uh, I, I think what we will focus on is is kind of doubling down um, to a large extent uh, on this, um, so that we we can ensure you know quality and you know it actually you know really there's a, a certain sort of self selection bias as well, but I think uh, the other aspect you know which kind of plays into to overall quality. Is if you have a strong loyalty program, um, which emphasizes that, um, you know, from a repeat customer court standpoint, and, and that's something that we've been uh, focused on uh, continuing to build out. And so, as we emerge from this period, we think that will also help drive you know, more towards quality and, and more towards uh, overall stellar unit economics. Okay, uh, Prashant, I think you wanted to add uh, add something here. Uh, yeah, what I was saying is uh, certainly this is a phase where. Uh, uh, people will look at fundamental economics. It's a phase where the primary optimization lever will move from growth to uh, sustainability and um, and uh, stronger economics across the board. So that would be the um, and it's it's driven not only by um, uh, the uh, a different kind of customer demographic coming and and more customers uh, coming to platforms like ours. It's also driven by the fact that the capital markets are going to uh, demand that. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a significant shift for all all startups, and everyone now needs to be very um, aware of where the uh, the next stage of um, financial support or capital will come to. What kind of metrics that game would actually see a, a little bit of uh, or a significant readjustment for the next couple of quarters at least. Okay, staying with you, Prashant. So. Uh, Post this scenario, when when startups come out of this, what would be the most challenging aspect to tackle? Would it be uh, human resources or the broken uh, uh, logistics chain, or uh, you know, what would be the, the most uh, uh, important things that people will have to uh, take tackle uh, when they are starting? I think different businesses will have different challenges. In our specific business, as I said. Demand is not a challenge, and supply our operations are geared up to deal with it. Uh, for us, the big challenge actually will be um, uh, making sure that uh, we keep our our burn under control, our economic strong, and our uh, our runway is uh, is very much clear. So I think um, the the big challenge in this environment will be cost rationalization and 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 fundraise. So that's for a business like One MG. For a lot of other businesses, it'll be fundamental re-engineering of the business models. So uh, those uh, different people will have different challenges. I see um, cost reduction, runway increase, and fundraise as uh, as the most important challenges coming out of this. Okay. Vipin, what about the fintech industry? 
Yeah, so I think for fintech industry, this is a, uh, you know, it's, it's an unfortunate uh, event what's unfolding, but it's going to be a big shot in the arm because, as I said, money was anyway going and becoming digital. Um, but now, given that we are in a lockdown and, you know, we are in a face-to-face, uh, we are not in a face-to-face environment, in a remote environment, um, any form of transactions, any form of commerce, and that happens between people and people or between people and companies uh, and, and between companies and companies, B2B, B2C, C2C, mm-hmm. C2C um, whether it is essential in nature, whether it is non-essential in nature, the first preference will be to do it digitally. So in overall banking, I think uh, anyway was going uh, digital in a big way. But uh, I think this is a wake up call, uh, not just for fintech companies, but also for all the banks that, you know, you just can't have uh, the same reliance on processes which involve uh, either paper um, or, you know, which involve a face-to-face interaction. So overall, I think for fintech, uh, I think this means uh, a very big positive. Uh, But I think uh, I would also add that a lot of fintech, especially digital credit, also benefits from the aspirational consumption uh, of companies as well as of consumers, uh, the aspiration to expand, the aspiration to spend more, the aspiration to travel, the aspiration to upgrade your phone. Uh, definitely, you know, credit uh, will definitely take a hit, at least in the short term, because people will be more focused, both individuals and companies will be more focused on saving. Uh, money. Uh, so there will be a lot more uh, refocus back on savings uh, and uh, less on credit. Uh, but overall, digital fintech uh, will see a, a, a huge, uh, is already seeing a huge spike. Okay. Uh, Rajiv, if we can uh, hear from you that what would be the uh, most challenging thing for food business foods that uh, are provided? Uh, yeah, I think Prashant and Vipin have, uh, you know, <clears throat> um, given great perspectives about their industries, which are also common for, you know, a uh, lot many other industries. Uh, I would say, you know, the other thing which for all startups would be would be something which is common is, is uh, how do you handle employee morale in this at this point in time? Demand and supply challenges are there, but I think it's it's important that uh, the startups employees, you know. Uh, stick stick around you know they are motivated especially at a time when uh, you know hikes and bonuses may or may not happen it's unlikely to happen in the short term uh, you know startups may have to even resort to uh, you know cutting down competition in the short term the ch- the biggest challenge i think on on the employee morale front is how do you keep uh, you know your your team engaged at this point in time in fact right now it's important that the team actually steps up when there is no additional hiring happening, um, you know how do you how do you motivate everybody to actually uh, give their 110 uh, percent or more at a time when, uh, from their own personal standpoint, uh, you know uh, things do not make uh, as much sense as earlier. So uh, I think what's important for startups at this point in time is to uh, communicate a lot more with employees. Uh, tell them about the situation, you know, as much as possible, uh, you know, share the true financial picture. I think in my personal view, uh, you know, sharing the, uh, the real picture always aligns the team better as compared to, uh, you know, uh, you know, not sharing, uh, you know, most of it thinking that it might uh, impact uh, morale. But I think it actually makes more sense to share as much as possible and, you know, the team will actually appreciate and uh, if the communication is handled in the right way, you know the team will rally behind the, uh, you know, behind the the founders. So I think com- in communicating a lot, keeping the team motivated, keeping the morale high is is one of the most important challenges that every startup should keep a hawk eye on. Greg, if I can ask you the same question, and then we'll open the uh, we'll open for question and answer. So, what is the most crucial aspect that uh, you know in the mobile space, especially? Uh, will have to be tackled post, uh, uh, you know, get back to normal. 
Sure. Well, yeah, I think for us, it's a slightly different uh, problem statement, actually. I mean, of course, I think, you know, I would uh, you know, echo some of the sentiments shared around sort of ground logistics. Um, you know, that is also a large component of our business where we have, you know, thousands of executives across cities. Um, so, so that in terms of the labor component, restarting that, um, you know, does become challenging. So we have our own sort of supply chain there as such. Um, so, so that's a non-trivial undertaking and it's something which will um, certainly be uh, somewhat disrupted as we get back uh, over the coming weeks and months. Um, but I think what, what's more slightly unique uh, to mobility and, you know, specifically on our side is that, um, you know, I think the, the whole notion of, uh, is it safe? You know, is it actually something which people can get comfort around uh, to, to go in, you know, take a self-drive car, uh, et cetera, whether it's for uh, a business purpose, whether it's for a leisure purpose, et cetera. Um, you know, so the, the communications, so the problem statement really revolves more around the communication um, and how do you get people comfortable uh, kind of going and, and taking these sort of trips, um, you know, again, uh, because the, the reality is it, it might take several months uh, if you're not able to kind of really nail the communication and give people the assurance uh, and, and showcase exactly how you're tackling uh, the problem statement of, of cleanliness, of sanitization, uh, et cetera. And, and so that's uh, something which, you know, the teams, you know, here have been, you know, certainly thinking around a lot. Um, you know, I, I think if you look across mobility, it's something which is probably even more so for players uh, you know, in the ride healing space. But, you know, it, it's definitely something which uh, still requires more attention and more thought. And it's not an easy problem. Uh, it's something which will probably require several iterations. Uh, thank you so much. That was uh, very insightful to know from, uh, you know, four different perspectives. So we can now start with uh, Q&A. Uh, uh, if we can have questions, please. Okay, we can have the first question from Vivek. <coughs> Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, this is Vivek. So my question uh, is, uh, I mean, how do you uh, ensure to keep your employees and uh, uh, drivers covered in, in such scenarios? And uh, would you increase the price uh, post-COVID or uh, will you keep the shelf price same? Sure, sure. So, yeah, thanks, Vivek. I mean, so maybe to tackle the second question first. Uh, so. You know, for us, uh, you know, right now, we don't have any expectation that we would be modifying our prices. Um, you know, that's something, um, you know, which would remain, um, you know, somewhat fluid depending on how the situation picks up. But, you know, I, I think uh, our, our broader belief is that, you know, we would keep prices, um, you know, in line uh, with what we were, were doing earlier. Um, you know, I think in terms of the first point, um, you know, in, in terms of the, the employees, the, the workers there, um, you know, I, I think certainly, you know, we've, from our, our ground logistics staff, uh, we've kind of looked at really ensuring that we're going above and beyond in terms of, you know, providing uh, certain resources to them, you know, in terms of masks, in terms of, um, you know, gloves, uh, and, you know, the, the requisite uh, materials for, uh, you know, keeping the, the necessary hygiene uh, with the vehicles. So, you know, that's something that you know, we've done and come up with custom uh, sort of cleaning solutions to ensure that, um, the, the vehicles are, are properly sanitized, et cetera. Um, you know, that's something which um, you will continue to do. Um, you know, we've, we've given, we've even extended uh, work from home office uh, offers, in fact, um, to all of our um, sort of call center, um, you know, sort of customer care support for an extended period of time um, due to, to cloud telephony, um, you know, which is helpful because, you know, in, in this business where there's you know, a heavy operating component, um, you know, it's, it's important that you're, you're not losing sight of the, of the customer. Um, so you need to have these these folks working, uh, you know, in, in most cases around the clock when uh, you know business does resume. Um, but we wanted to retain you know certain flexibility there uh, for for that staff uh, on the uh, support end as well because uh, it's a very important asset. Uh, so yeah, I, mean, I think we we look at it you know very three sixty on the on the on the business side of things. Um, you know, we I, I don't think we're doing necessarily um, any, anything different in in terms of uh, you know employees per se. Um, but yeah, I'd be curious to hear from others on that as well. Thank you, Greg. Uh, can we have the next question, please? We can take the next question from Shrey. Hi, uh, so my question is for Prashant, actually. 
so we are in the same similar business in terms of medicine delivery and delivery of essential goods and uh, uh, in, in that particular category we are not facing a lot of issues when it comes to operations in tier 1 but uh, since majority of the folks that are in need of some, something like this are sitting out of tier 2 and tier 3 how are you managing that particular demand yeah so um, <clears throat> every day we are getting uh, opening new new pin codes so um, when we uh, when the lockdown started we uh, first day was zero then we got the metros going uh, then we started reaching out to uh, to a bunch of uh, third party logistics companies so today we are covering around 16000 pin codes uh, uh, largely because the deliveries and express bees and ecom expresses are coming live what we also have done in more than 50 cities is uh, is uh, quickly identified uh, new vendor partners who can do local uh, uh, the local retailers who can do local delivery so uh, it's still a challenge it's not um, uh, medicine deliveries are delayed into states and depending on the city is actually very very tough right now so i think uh, what we as a company what we are doing is expanding the network of retailers in small towns and cities see if we can um, rope in as many as we can and bring them onto the platform and uh, in cities where we don't have a a quality uh, a partner then uh, we rely on the third party logistics so right now as i said more than 50 60 cities have uh, we've already signed up new vendors uh, for those particular cities located in there and the rest of it is is being covered by uh, 3pl thank you prashant uh, next question if you can have please we can have sanya next hello yeah we can hear you sanya go ahead with your question yeah okay so i work in the retail industry as a brand manager so this industry is again very badly affected so my question to you is that what do you think that the new normal will look like after the lockdown how do you think that the situation will change uh, and the consumer attitude okay okay uh, uh uh rather with you if you if you if you can answer the question please uh so uh, sanya i think uh, if we have to think of retail as uh, offline retail versus online retail um you know we do we do in the short term see a drop in uh, offline retail for sure and many sectors even in online uh, retail uh, if we specifically have to talk about uh, the food sector where uh, rebel foods operates in uh you know we've done some surveys and we've seen that uh, increasingly for customers uh you know uh, new parameters will become more relevant such as the uh, safety uh, you know hygiene um of of food and you know uh, more shift will happen towards restaurants which can be trusted uh as compared to you know <clears throat> price convenience etc uh you know which were probably the bigger factors earlier so uh, so we strongly believe that in the food sector uh, you know trust will become increasingly more important as compared to you know uh, say price discount etc and i think similarly every sector will have to uh, you know uh, find out how their consumers are changing um, you know in the uh, in the short term as well as in the long term um, you know for example fncg sector we are seeing that you know for a company like hul um, you know sanitizers the life boy product portfolio is obviously right now more relevant than the ax product portfolio because everybody is sitting at home and people don't necessarily need to use as much deodorant as they need to use sanitizers so i think every uh, fmcg company every retailer has to think of where the consumer demand is shifting and accordingly uh, you know uh, strategize on where they move their internal resources towards from building their future uh, future uh product portfolio which is going to be increasingly more relevant for customers for us for example we've started focusing even more on you know how we can build trust with customers and you know make our pro- portfolio even more uh safe for the customer okay prashant would you want to weigh in here yeah i think uh, uh for the foreseeable future at least uh, this financial um uh physical retail experience retail all of that would actually uh, be uh, be struggling i think it's um, 
one needs to reinvent a lot of uh, the like it really has to be a a a, a safe safety first experience and i think a lot of that i don't know how the new world of retail will look like but uh, people right now i don't see many of them wanting to go um into crowded uh, retail location so is there a new model of retail where uh, people have much more um uh, experiential but safe um, um system of retail i don't know what it will look like certainly i expect uh, retail to be slow this year if in uh, i know uh, uh, you know you we also you were saying that you know uh, branches are not working and also do you think this is again uh, being twice lucky for the fintech sector once it happened when it said that the monetization happened so is this the second moment for the fintech uh, retail uh, look at you think about the banking business yeah so see i mean i think you know if the question is uh, if the question is around retail i think uh, my view is uh, that any form of discretionary spend uh, which is uh, linked to consumption uh, you know people trying new experiences new products new services um or going for more expensive products and services i think that is going to uh, take a back seat uh, at least for this financial year because uh, right now everybody is uh, you know consumers uh, businesses everybody is very scared i mean that they want to spend and that too they will you know as um, and this have been mentioned uh, you know when they step into a retail location they will be very mindful of uh, safety and health aspects and i think even when ordering online uh, you know the, uh, it will be a very decisive factor in terms of in terms of where they order for so not just price but also uh, the health and safety uh, you know of the product uh, so it, it it will have a that has a lot of impact on fintech as i already said which means that you know people take loans to you know upgrade their televisions or you know buy a new washing machine or a new air conditioner uh, or you know to travel uh, abroad for the first time a uh, lot of the millennials uh, young people uh, have been used to spending a lot using their credit cards uh, or taking loans uh, at zero interest in order to uh, spend and keep up their lifestyle so overall i think lifestyles in my view for a lot of the younger aspirational population uh, will undergo a big change and um, at least in the short to medium term uh, this will mean that they will spend less so um, you know brands which um, are more essential in nature or and uh, you know reimpose uh, the safety and health aspect will actually stand to uh, win in a in a in a very big way Okay, thank you. Uh, can we ask the next question? I think from Rishi, we have the next question. Hello. Yes, Rishi, we can hear you, please. Yeah. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Ah, uh, so ah, uh, like uh, my question is to all the founders. I have my own apparel e-com brand. It's It's a fairly new startup. I started it in August last year, and of course, during this time when uh, uh, like the revenues are actually zero since uh, like the lockdown, and even the sales that we had in the like the uh, last week before the lockdown, it was all returned or not accepted because of the chaos that was going on. so my uh, question is like basically in three parts uh, like firstly that uh, of course how do i manage my overheads with zero revenue and of course we do not run on profits that much because it's a startup i have a lot of overheads because of lesser volumes second is uh, like how are the investors affected during this time because uh, i was looking forward for investors after a little bit of stability so of course how like how were they affected and when would be the right time to approach and uh, of course any marketing strategies or any suggestions because apparel is a non essential product and it's 
it's a fashion product so of course like how do i go about it and how do i manage it uh, greg would you want to take that one sorry Hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, Greg. Uh, sure. Sure. Yeah. On the cost, I would say, and this has been, you know, suggested, I think, by some of the other panelists as well, um, that it's it's really important to take a a really hard look at all of your fixed costs uh, on a line by line basis, and sort of see what you could actually rework, revamp, uh, renegotiate, cut out, uh, and you know, I think that's firstly where you have to kind of look because you know, that's where the, the fat would ultimately be. Um, and then even some of your other you know, potential, like say distribution or other you know, deals that are more upstream, I think all of that would need to be revisited uh, at this point of time. And you, know, you can certainly look for certain relaxations, certain moratoriums, uh, much like the RBI circular that came in recently um, on, the, on the debt side. Uh, but there's other ways that you can um, you know, look at potentially uh, leveraging you know, some of this like, near-term interim relief. Um, you know, and, and, and so I think that's something that you can always look at from your side. Uh, on, the, on the fundraising side, of, of, of course, it, it will be a challenge. There's no doubt over the next um, you know, six months, uh, maybe even longer, could even go uh, for 12 to 18 months. But I, I think what uh, typically at your stage, <clears throat> what's oftentimes best is to uh, kind of align yourself with um, you know, people who are uh, more sort of experts in that respective industry, so being apparel, so someone who understands that space um, as a as a high net worth individual, as an angel investor, um, having you know two or three of those individuals can come together uh, and you know write uh, slightly smaller check sizes uh, in this environment. Uh, you know it's it's always easier to have you know that sort of round as opposed to a, a more sort of institutional or quasi institutional round. Um, so I, I think you know getting them uh, familiar and excited with the broader brand and the, the longer term vision. Um, should still be something which is is possible. Um, you know, I think at this point of time, you know, it's it's of course most startups. You're not, uh, especially in early stages, you're not going to be in a position to to take uh, you know very very strong terms. So I, I think just probably be a little, little flexible and open minded about some of decent outcome. Uh, sorry if I could just add. Uh, I'm I know I've you know not been. Uh, to comment, but you know, just to just to add to that, uh, you know, I was reading up uh, that in in China and in some of the other places, uh, you know, uh, masks were were something where the market obviously exploded, and uh, there were some companies which pivoted into making masks, not just the standard conventional masks, but you know, also very interesting uh, new designs of masks, uh, so that you know people could sort of use that as the only you know fashion statement, even if they are at home and they're on on video chat and on house party, etc. Uh, so, uh, so you know, just as a suggestion, you could possibly look at that market that if you can use your team to develop, uh, you know, masks, aprons, gloves, some of the things which are becoming more and more relevant in this time, and see if uh, you know uh, you can spend some time, um, you know, exploring those opportunities because they might become uh, very relevant in the short term. Just as a as an additional thought. That's, that's very interesting. Uh, uh, next question we have from Anish. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Anish, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, so my, my question is to the entire panel. I wanted to understand what is, uh, in your in your opinion, what is going to be the change in the foreign investor sentiment pre and post COVID. But uh, I would want to understand from the investor's point of view, is the Indian market going to be attractive investment opportunity for them for the long term? Or do this see it going downwards only? Okay, I'll start. I'll take that. Um, uh, so I think um, there are two, three parts to it. One is um, for the early stage market, I think investment activity will pick up sooner because the the fact is that the VCs in India right now are actually sitting on a lot of dry powder. They, they raised good money recently, so there will be certainly more uh, or, or decent enough activity. Um, so you have to break it down early stage, late stage, and short term, long term. 
So early stage, we'll see uh, a short term slowdown a little bit where people are first figuring out their existing portfolios and uh, what all they need to go through this phase before they look at uh, external ones. But in general, in principle, not a problem um, uh, of uh, a significant like for a series A, series B kind of play. For late stage, um, the, the immediate phase will be tougher um, because people just cannot travel to do diligence, to do management meetings, things like that. Just from a practical perspective, it's unlikely that there would be too much um, new investments um, coming in, even if there is appetite. From a long-term perspective, however, I think I'm, I'm actually very bullish um, on uh, India. So I think um, for this year is about just getting through it and surviving through it. But after that, actually a lot of capital around the world is is looking for diversification. Uh, a lot of Chinese investors are looking to invest outside China. A lot of other investors who are over-indexed on um, China as a geography and there's a lot of capital that was, is going to find new areas where they would be looking at uh, uh, more uh, diversification and uh, new areas of growth. So um, for the growth stage, I would say short term, they would be it would be hard to raise fresh capital for in the long term this is going to be a positive from the Indian ecosystem perspective early stage players will not feel so much pain it's just a couple of months as the as the investors kind of get into a stable zone then they have they are sitting on enough capital they will have to deploy Ripen, your views? yeah so I think you know uh, Prashant covered that well I think long term see look a medium to long term uh, everybody Every investor, foreign investor, domestic investor, everybody will be back in action right now. Just the situation is that things are a bit uncertain, quite uncertain, because people don't know what, what is the extent of the you know economic uh, uh, and which industries uh, are getting affected. There is early data, but there's still you know investors are in the risk business of evaluating risk. So uh, I think there for this quarter, which is April, May, June quarter, I think you can assume that um, uh, you know investing activity will be very little. But I think after this quarter, and depending on how the recovery is uh, on the health side and also on the economic side, I think India is uh, con continues to burn. Uh, last year. Uh, you know, and it's, it's it's just do not have a sound business fundamentals. Businesses which are primarily top of the funnel businesses, which means they whether uh, they are driving on uh, some kind of metrics which are not linked to revenue or profitability. Uh, I think those businesses will have a big challenge convincing uh, any kind of investors to give them money. Uh, on the other hand, investors, which are uh, businesses which are built more bottoms up, where you can prove that a single transaction uh, makes money, uh, it, is a B, it could be a B2C scenario, it could be a B2B scenario, uh, will have a much better opportunity, even if the scale is smaller. Because I think there is an overall reset in the market, not just uh, in the private uh, fundraising, but also in the public markets. Uh, the valuations have been reset in a very big way. And um, a lot of the public companies, which were also uh, expanding a lot by burning cash, that is all uh, completely, uh, you know, under uh, uh, has undergone a big change. So you can expect that in 2020, in the second half of 2020, or in the first quarter of, um, you know, 2021, uh, when you go out and raise money from foreign investors, be prepared to answer questions around how your business. Uh, is going to make money now. Uh, it's not a, no longer about an Excel, uh, you know, where you project that I will get these many customers and then I will make money. Uh, no, it won't be sufficient. You will actually have to prove that in segments, uh, you know, it, it may not be necessary to be profitable, but it will be definitely necessary to be positive on unit economics. Uh, we're just uh, running out of time, so we'll just take one more final question uh, from Dheeraj. This question is to everyone. Uh, I'm from a testing services firm on the quality assurance side. 
So I would like to understand how uh, how will the IT industry be during this time? I mean, like you know, will the startups be interested to utilize this downtime for any of the initiatives around engineering or development, or let's say on the QA side? Okay. Um, so strategic initiatives to work on it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Raju, would you want to take this one? <coughs> Um, so, uh, see, I think um, during the entire discussion, um, it, one thing which is definitely coming out is that uh, projects, even and even relevant for the IT sector, projects which are more of essential in nature for companies such as you know banking services, etc., they will definitely continue. But you know, uh, projects around innovation, etc., in the short term would definitely be impacted. I would say that uh, don't lose hope uh, over the medium term. This is hopefully a, just a short term scenario. And, uh, you know, sooner than later in the next few months, you know, things sh should start, uh, you know, going back uh, to, to normalcy. Uh, IT is one industry which can still function very well in a remote, um, you know, in a remote manner. So I would say that I see it as being less impacted. Various governments around the world, led by the United States, are pumping in money as uh, as packages to uh, rescue industries out of the situation. And let's just hope that you know that money is utilized in the right way, so that there is there is minimum impact on the sector. And I think a lot of that will will be used for for tech services. That's what my view would be. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think we will will take uh, uh, one more question. It is from Nilesh. Uh, Nilesh, if you can, uh, uh, if you can uh, state your question, please. Yes, hi, hi everyone. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so my question is uh, specifically to Greg, and I wanted to ask uh, that how do you think uh, the demand uptake would, uh, uh, how will we be seeing demand uptake post this entire fiasco ends? And uh, since travel and mobility has been hit, largely compared to the other sectors as well. What is the opinion of investors in this entire scenario? <clears throat> sure. Well, you know, I, I think ultimately it's important to, to take a short-term view, a medium-term and a long-term view. Uh, I think with mobility, I mean, that's a fundamental service to everyday life. And I think that's, if you look at the structural demand over the, the medium-term to long-term, uh, that can only go up uh, because you're seeing an increase in urbanization. Uh, you're seeing an increase in overall per capita income. And so as those two mega trends continue uh, and, and combine with digitization, so that's something which you know, undoubtedly the, the long-term curve has to, to move in a certain direction. Um, you know, I, I think again, it's really to echo a lot of the sentiments here. Uh, it, it's really about the businesses that can demonstrate strong new economics uh, and a, a consistent business case uh, where investors will certainly gravitate towards. You know, I, I think if you see um, you know, businesses that have um, you know, more of a, of a focus on um, you know, really, really stellar quality transactions um, you know, that are you know, able to repeat in nature. Uh, if you're able to, to do that consistently, uh, then I think you know, certainly you will continue to see um, significant interest uh, you know, from the investor community in the mobility space. Okay, uh, I will just take one more question that's from Harshit. Uh, Harshit, you can go ahead with your question. I think uh, we were not able to connect to Harshit. Well, uh, that was very insightful, uh, gentlemen, and uh, thank you for, uh, 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 for being a panelist here. I request the attendees to fill a short the survey form post the session, which will be available to you. And it was wonderful to have uh, all of you here. Uh, we wish to uh, see you again in the near future and hopefully uh, at a time when we are free to move around. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you, everyone.